Now, our people at the back, we're about to have our first keynote. If you want to just come in subtly and find there's some great seats right down the front here in particular while I'm doing our intro of our next keynote speaker, a globally known tech security guru, Ted Speaker, Chief Research Officer of F Secure. He's written on research from the New York Times, Wired, Scientific America. He's been on international TV, a nine-page profile in Vanity Fair, if you don't mind. Selected among the 50 most important people on the web by PC World Magazine, included in the FP Global 100 Thinkers list. He's a member of the board of the Nordic Business Forum, probably my favourite business forum worldwide, ladies and gentlemen. He is the man, our opening keynote speaker. Please, a big round of applause for Mikko Hippinen. Thank you, Adam. Good morning, my name is Mikko. And yes, I am a geek and a nerd. And yes, I do live in Helsinki, which is in Finland, which is in Europe. And I have been doing InfoSec all my life. I'll be 50 years old this year, so that's a pretty long time to be working with computer security. But it's not just me which is turning 50 this year. If you've uh, read about the history of uh, ARPANET, you do recall that uh, the historic first packets ever sent over uh, ARPANET, which then became the internet, were logged by hand into this IMB logbook, which had an entry on the 29th of October 1969, saying that the first message was successfully sent from one machine to another on a network, which then became what we today know as the internet. That's a pretty big deal. Now, Internet obviously didn't become an overnight success. It became the thing that we know today with utilities and applications that we could all use. I guess, most importantly, the web. And the web isn't 50 years old. The web is 30 years old, although for most of us it's 25 years old because the web really became mainstream in 1994. 1994, 1995. I set up the first website for our company in April 1994. And I remember that there were 16 websites in our country. We were website number 17. That's, that's how early days it was. But the change from the web then was very, very fast. The world changed. The world changed during our lifetime. What internet did was it took away borders. Borders Distance and geography disappeared. Disappeared in a good way and, well, the reason why we're here, in a bad way. Now, obviously, we had computer security problems before the internet. You know, things spreading on floppy disks. You might remember these. Viruses which would infect boot sectors of five and quarter inch floppy disks or three and a half inch floppy disks and would go around the world as people would travel and physically carry these on themselves. Those were a real problem, but obviously when you look at the speed of spreading in the hindsight from those, it's nothing to compare to what happened then when email became commonplace and then eventually web became such a big deal that we could have things like, you know, exploit kits and phishing sites and things like that. And now the web and the internet and applications and mobile phones are such an integrated part of our everyday lives, it's hard to remember how it was. So, let's talk about Austria. <laughs> a couple of months ago I had a chat with a colleague at the office, a young guy, maybe 25 years old, one of the young coders we've recruited from university who had just come back from a business trip in Vienna, Austria. And we chatted about Austria, and I mentioned to him about this holiday that I took to Austria when I was his age, like around 1992, 1993. Me and a couple of friends went to Austria, we rented a car, we drove to the Alps, where we had pre-booked a boat which we rented, and we went sailing on a, on a lake in the middle of the Alps. And then this young coder asked me, how did you actually do that? Like, how, 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 did, you, how did you plan all that? How did you 
find where you want to go. How did you rent the boat? How did you rent the car? Where did you find boat rental places before the internet? Because this was before the internet. Web wasn't there. And I was baffled. I had no idea. I, I, I absolutely couldn't recall how, how we did this before the internet, but we did. And I really had to like think back and try to remember, like, how did things work before the internet? I, and I, I guess I called international dial assistance, which is a number that you used to call, where there was a lady with phone books for different countries. And you would ask her that, hey, I'm looking for boat rental places in Austria. And she would pick Austrian yellow pages and try to find things and give you numbers. And then you would call those places with my school German to pre-book a boat. And then, of course, when we rented the car, there is no GPS, there is no mobile phone. It seems like ancient history. And this is 25 years ago. World is changing fast. Changing for the better, mostly. But also, in some ways, changing for the worst. Before the internet, we only had to worry about the criminals who were living close to us. That's it. Now we have to worry about criminals who can be anywhere on the planet. That's the downside. Now, don't get me wrong. There's much more good upsides than downsides that the internet has brought us. But it has changed, for the first time, the risk ratio of an average person that he is now more likely to become a victim of a crime in the online world than the real world. And that's a pretty big shift. And it's happening right now. So, one thing that I keep wondering about myself is that after all the lessons that we've learned in computer security about about how to make better and more secure systems, how to build security at every layer of new developments, how come we keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again? In many ways, when you look at some computer security, everything old is new again. We keep running into the same problems. Let me give you an example. This is the AIDS Information Trojan from 1989, 1980s. A ransom Trojan from 1980s, for real. Yes, this was a ransom Trojan. It was distributed on a floppy because internet didn't exist. People were mailed this floppy, which claimed to be a useful application. When you installed it, after a couple of days, it would encrypt the hard drive and show you a ransom note, like this. In 1989, compare that to Petya, which is one of the most well-known current ransom trojan it's almost exactly the same thing except of course in 1989 it wasn't asking for bitcoin it was asking you to do a wire transfer to a p.o box in panama nevertheless everything old is new again another example many of you remember macroviruses 1999 2000 2001 love letter nuclear larue infecting Word, Excel, PowerPoint, spreading over macros. We got rid of this problem because Microsoft changed the way Microsoft Office works. They disabled macros by default to get rid of the macrovirus problem. They did this in Microsoft Office 2003, a long time ago, 16 years ago. And now when we look at the problems we're seeing today, we're seeing macroviruses or macro malware again. And the same default setting that was changed in 2003 is still there. Macros are disabled by default, which means today the attacks try to trick you into clicking the most dangerous button that you have in Microsoft Office, the enable content button, which is the button that they introduced in 2003. If there are macros in the file you open, they are disabled, but they will helpfully prompt you if you might want to enable them anyway. And now the, the attacks are trying to trick you into clicking that button, which sounds pretty innocent. It's enabling content. So I have friends who work at Microsoft. Actually, I have friends who work in the Microsoft Office team, and I've told them that they should rename the button to infect my system. Because then, maybe then, people wouldn't be so keen on clicking on that. So yes, 
Everything old is new again. We keep repeating the same mistakes. Another example, Telnet. Unencrypted terminal connection from one machine to another, which, mean, which means anybody who's watching the traffic sees everything. It's unencrypted. So if you're doing the Telnet session over Wi-Fi, anybody who's there will get your passwords and whatever you type. Such a horribly bad idea. We got rid of Telnet in the 1990s. And now when you look where we are today with this brave new world of Internet of Things and connected devices, for some reason that I cannot explain, we are reintroducing Telnet as a service on these devices, most of which are running Linux, so they are Unix systems, same kind of systems which we got rid of Telnet D in 1995 or 1997. When we look at the botnets that we are now seeing, which only infect IoT devices, which refuse to infect real computers, many of those are using Telnet as the way in, most famously Mirai which actually has a built-in built -in list of Telnet usernames and passwords. It tries to gain access, like admin, admin, support, support, root, root, all my favorite motherfucker. <laughs> I don't really know why it tries logging in as mother and password as, but it does. Maybe there is a system somewhere which this is the default password. So yes, we keep repeating the same mistakes. And to make this harder, when we, when we succeed in our work, nothing happens. That's a pretty, pretty big downer, actually. When we are successful, nothing happens. Like, if you do your job right, your company and your clients will not be on the cover of the newspaper tomorrow. Because there never is a newspaper which would have headlined that, you know, the biggest company in Australia was not hacked yesterday. That's not news. And I sometimes end up in discussions over this, because I, I do a lot of meetings with F-Secure's clients and customers, typically, you know, board meetings or leadership team meetings, and it's typically the CFO who looks at the figures and he's like, hmm, we're paying you guys, it says here, we're paying you guys 50,000 euros a year. Why are we paying you guys 50,000 euros a year? We have no security problems. And what I typically reply with is that, well, you know what, Mr. CFO? It's awfully clean here in your boardroom. Why don't you fire all your cleaners and janitors? Clearly you don't need them. So when we do our jobs right, we're invisible. But when we fail, it is very visible. And today, as more and more of our systems and services are moving from traditional on-prem systems into the cloud, this is becoming more and more important because we are becoming service providers. Every company already became a software company five years ago. That's old news. Every company is a software company. Your company, regardless of what you do, is a software company. What's happening now is that every company is becoming a software service provider. We are becoming cloud providers for our customers. And that means that when we fail, it's not just that we have problems internally, it's that our clients and customers have problems. And we have plenty of examples of this happening in different countries over and over again. Plenty of examples from this year where uh, service providers or software as a service providers are unable to provide the service because their cloud instances have been wiped by a ransomware Trojan, which got in because a clerk in the financial department clicked on an Excel attachment they got over email. And I'll tell you what, that's no longer good enough. The fact that someone opened a bad spreadsheet should never be the reason that your customers can't work. But that's exactly what has happened over and over again over the last months. We're becoming service providers. And it is a game of cat and mouse. Whatever new safety precautions we are implementing, 
the attackers are watching and trying to figure out ways to get around them. So things like moving our email servers from our own hosted servers into cloud, let's say Office 365, only means that the attackers will follow from the on-prem systems into the cloud systems. So we introduce new safety precautions like two-factor authentication with SMS-based auth or even better application or authenticator-based authentication and the attackers will follow. Let's have a look at a real attack from not too long ago, a couple of weeks ago. You get an email, a file has been shared with you, please follow the link, you follow the link, you end up in OneDrive, which is where you have files anyway, because your organization is running Office 365, and it asks you to authenticate to gain access to the file. Now, so you take a look at the URL, because that's what you've been trained to do, and there is the lock, all right, great. But you know that the lock itself isn't good enough. But then you look at the URL, and it is office.com, which is a Microsoft domain. And this is a Microsoft login. Hmm. And it's asking for your username. It's asking for your password. Now, obviously, it's a phishing site, because forms.office.com is a forms hosting site where anybody can create forms like a form which says OneDrive sign in to continue, please give your username. But beyond that, it's also a man in the middle attack because when you give this form a real username and real password, it will take them and immediately use them to log in to the real Office 365, which then triggers the real Office 365 server, triggers a two-factor authentication query. And this, of course, means that the real user gets a real notification on their real device, which makes perfect sense, because he or she is really logging into a service, or so they believe. So they will, of course, punch in the uh, code that they just received. And attacks like these are hard to fight as long as we keep using authentication mechanisms which are relying on the users being able to tell the difference between a real URL or a bad URL, when URLs can look so confusing. Office.com. It's hard to tell your users that don't trust content from Office.com, is it? And yes, everything is becoming a computer. If it uses electricity, it will become a computer. I'm not worried about IoT revolution of smart devices. That doesn't worry me at all. What I am worried about is stupid devices. Stupid devices going to the internet. And this hasn't happened yet. We have right now a revolution where you go and buy a smart watch, a smart car, smart TV. And when you, as a consumer, buy those things, you know that they are on the internet. That's why you bought them. You bought the smart TV so you could watch Netflix on the TV. It's obvious that it's on the internet. You know that it's on the internet. But in the near future, stupid devices will go on the internet as well. And you have no idea that they are on the internet. Because they will not be going to the internet to provide new features and services to you, the consumer, they will be going to the internet to provide benefits to the manufacturer. So simple, simple stupid household items will be going to the internet just for the reason that the manufacturers want to know where their clients are. How often do they use these devices? How often do they have failures? Which means when you go and buy devices in the future, you are not even told that they are going to go to the internet. And they will not be going to the internet using a Wi-Fi connection that you could block. They will be going to the internet using 5G or Zigfox or something that you can't block. And there's nothing we can do to prevent this. This revolution is already underway. You can't stop this revolution from refusing to play part because you will play part. Because you won't even know which of the devices you will buy will be on the internet. This revolution hasn't gone through yet because it's still too expensive to add 
an IoT chipset or a Sigfox chipset and, a, well, eventually a 5G modem into every device. But as you know, technology becomes cheaper and cheaper. In 10 years, it's going to be so cheap, connectivity can be put into anything. And then it will. And this revolution has been a long time coming. IoT and connected devices really started from factories and plants. Factory automation companies started building plant automation systems, computerized plant automation systems, already in the 1980s. Today, every factory, every plant, every power plant, every nuclear power plant, every food processing plant runs on computers. Our society runs on computers. And we got an excellent reminder of this seven weeks ago in this facility, which belongs to Norsk Hydro, which is the second largest company in Norway. One of the largest aluminum manufacturers in the world, with factories around the world, including aluminum factories in Qatar and in Brazil. And on the Tuesday morning, seven weeks ago, when employees got to their office, there was a handwritten note at every office door which says, do not turn on your computer. There's a note at the bottom which has an added note an hour later that it's okay to turn on your phone, but don't turn on your computer. And the, if this ever happens to you, this is a bad sign. <laughs> this was Locker Goga. There's two similar gangs going, or, going around now with ransom trojans, Locker Goga and Mega Cortex. And these ransom trojans are different from the ones we used to know, like Crypto Wall and Crypto Locker or WannaCry and Petya, because these things do not spread. They are not worms. They're not viruses. They are targeted. The attackers, the gangs, will pick a company. Then they start scanning the perimeter, trying to find ways in, typically looking for VPN endpoints or OWA sites or some way in. And once they gain access, then they use lateral movement, trying to gain access to everything, going from one data center to another. And once they are happy with the level of access they have, once they believe that they can destroy everything in one go, that's what they do. In this case, in the middle of the night, between Monday and Tuesday, all the data centers went down. They were wiped with a very fast encryption algorithm, which tried deleting everything or encrypting everything. And then, when they were done, they were not asking for Bitcoin. No. They simply left their contact information. Here's our email. Please get in touch. Let's negotiate. That's what they do. And this is a different beast. This is a different kind of a problem than the traditional random malware, which would then use encryption mechanisms to strike a ransom Trojan attack against your organizations, because these are targeted. And the ransom Trojan problem really plays on a very old idea that we've seen for years and years with cyber criminals. The old idea that you steal information and then you sell that information to the highest bidder. This is what cyber criminals have been doing for years and years. Well, it's exactly the same idea in ransom trojans. It's just that the attackers realize that in many cases the highest bidder is the victim themselves. They are willing to pay more for the data than anyone else. So if you can destroy the data and make sure they can't restore it or recover it in a timely fashion, they will pay you the ransom. And when this hit the news, initially it looked really, really worrying because this is aluminum manufacturing. And if you know anything about aluminum manufacturing, and I didn't know anything about it before this, these factories are very, very fragile. They run 24 hours a day. Basically, you build an aluminum factory, you boot it up, and then it never stops. Because if you have to stop it, you will lose the factory. Aluminum melts in, and you will never be able to recover it. 
sounds like theoretical. This has actually happened. The last time this has happened, it was in February in Venezuela, as government of Venezuela has been having extended power cuts, after which, as a result of which, they lost all of their aluminum factories, and they will be without any capability to make any aluminum for at least a year. However, with this company, it didn't happen. We know that they had to take all of their computing systems offline, including the PLCs controlling their factories. But they didn't, didn't lose a single factory. They were able to keep every factory operating without computers. How the hell do you do that? How on earth do you keep a modern factory running without computers? Well, the answer is they were able to do it because they still had these. You know, old farts who remember how it used to be. <laughs> Basically guys like me. Basically guys like me who travels the world carrying floppy disks and uh, punch cards. You remember these? These are how we used to store information. Okay, you want a punch card? Here we go. They're, they're cheap. They're cheap. Here we go. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, don't put them on eBay. So, these guys still remembered how it used to be, how factories used to operate before we had PLCs, before we had computers, who still had binders full of papers with calculations and numbers. This is what saved these particular factories. Now, the question is, how much longer will we be able to do this? Five years? Ten years? Not much longer. And everything is becoming a computer. Everything turns into a computer. And some of these devices that are turning into computers have very, very long life cycles. I think a prime example is cars. You look, look at the car that you would buy today. Clearly, it's a computer. A modern car is a data center on four wheels. So how long is that new car that you buy today going to be on the roads? If it's not crashed, it's going to be on the roads for, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years, 50 years, maybe. Maybe. I'm right now driving a 19-year-old car. I plan on driving it for at least 10 more years. But as they are now cars, then the question becomes, how long will these data centers be getting patches? You know, security patches. So I asked my Twitter followers, and the consensus was that car manufacturers should be providing patches for their cars for 25 years. 25 years. Right now, nobody's providing security patches for anything for more than 15 years, typically more than five years. The only exception seems to be Windows XP, which simply refuses to die. And when we look at the situation right now, people are really getting over-the-air updates to their cars as they're driving around. But will they be getting the patches when the car is 25 years old? We really don't know. We don't know if this is going to be supportable. Everything is becoming a computer. Some of these things have very long life cycles, and we have no idea how the patches will be handled when the device is going to be 20, 30, 40 years old. And we, of course, all know about the patching which is right now underway for these 737 MAX 8s. When the patches for these will be ready, I wonder if they are also going to be over-the-air patches. <laughs> Sometimes we are developing new technology and we fa fall in love with the technology. We innovate something great and we deploy and implement it everywhere, only to realize decades later that it was a horribly bad idea. Let me play you a TV ad from 1950s. Smart woman, she's putting a new floor down by herself. Wise woman, she's using Kentile vinyl asbestos tile. Easiest flooring to install, easiest flooring to care for. Save every way with Kentile vinyl asbestos tile. Kentile, vinyl asbestos tiles. Best idea ever, asbestos. 
Let's just put it everywhere, like, you know, kitchen tiles and paint and insulation and pipes and whatever. Well, as asbestos was a great idea. It was a really remarkable, really revolutionary material with great, great benefits, which turned out to be a horribly bad idea. And what's happening right now around us could eventually turn out to be IT asbestos. Yeah, let's turn everything into a computer. Let's put everything on the internet. Let's take these horribly insecure IoT devices running Linux with a kernel from early 2000s and a built-in password which cannot be changed by the customer and just deploy them globally. That's what we're doing today. And in 10, 15, 20 years, we'll be looking back at these years and scratching our heads that what the hell were we thinking? What we are creating right now could be the next big headache that we have to worry about for the upcoming decades. IT asbestos, mark my words. And then we have a totally different set of problems ahead of us in the future as we think about what's happening with governments. Now, most organizations do not have to worry about governmental attacks. But some organizations do. And by the way, take a look at these guys' march. That's pretty neat. I've seen your military march. It doesn't look like this. It doesn't look like this at all. So three weeks ago, a lawyer in London got a phone call in the middle of the night. Actually, three calls, Mid missed calls, because he was asleep and the phone was silent. When he woke up in the morning, he picked up the phone, an iPhone, looked at it, and okay, three missed calls. From a phone number which starts with plus four six, and that's the country code for Sweden. The lawyer was in London, he's like, hmm, weird. And they weren't phone calls, they were video calls. Video calls over WhatsApp. And those calls in the middle of the night to a human rights lawyer in London three weeks ago were the reason why you got a patch for your phones. And the attack that was targeting that human rights lawyer was launched by an Israeli company who was targeting, well, if not Mr. Jamal Khashoggi himself, at least his personal friends, after which this journalist was brutally murdered by the Saudi Arabian government. So why was this company, Israeli company, targeting a human rights lawyer in London with WhatsApp zero-day vulnerability? Well, because he was running civil litigation against the company from people who had been targeted by rogue governments, like the Saudi government, trying to gain access to their mobile phones with unknown exploits. And cases like these are rare. I mean, this was deployment with zero-day vulnerability. Our statistics on how many times during a year we see a real attack against real users using a zero-day vulnerability, there's like 20 or 30 attacks like that every year. It's, it's rare because zero days are rare and zero days are valuable. Attackers don't like to use them because then you lose them. This particular attack means that all of us got a WhatsApp update last week. And if you haven't updated your WhatsApp, you should. Although it's not really obvious why you should. If you look at the release notes for the patch that patched it, it doesn't speak anything about the zero-day vulnerability. It speaks about new stickers. Nevertheless, update your WhatsApp. So the nature of conflict around us is changing. We used to be fighting traditional wars for thousands of years. Wars where we were fighting each other with bow and arrows and swords. But technology has always been shaping the phase of conflict and the phase of war. As we got good enough technology to take the war to seize, we did by building warships, creating air, uh, sea war and then air war. Technology shapes how we 
fight. But the innovation of sea war and air war did not take land war away. Conflict just expands into new domains. Then we got satellites and shit, which means space war. And now we got cyberspace war. And if you look at a modern conflict like, let's say, Russia, Ukraine, they are fighting that war in every single domain. Land, air, sea, space, and cyberspace. And this will not be the end of domains where we can fight. There will be new domains, like, I don't know, one day robots will be doing the fighting, or uh, we will be fighting DNA warfare, or, uh, I don't know, nano for warfare, which sounds like science fiction today, but then again, so did cyber war sound like science fiction just a couple of decades ago. And then I suppose eventually we will end up with machine learning and AI-based conflict. And you don't have to believe me on that. You can take that from uh, President Putin. Who is the leader in AI will lead the world. The good news is that right now, today, machine learning is basically only used by the good guys. It's not yet being used by bad guys. Security companies, including everyone, every single security company here, will tell you about how they use machine learning to build defenses. And we aren't really yet seeing attackers doing that. But that's going to change as well. Eventually, deployment of machine learning and AI systems will become so easy to use that any idiot will be able to use them. And then we will start seeing self-morphing malware which learns, or phishing attacks using machine learning tactics. All of these will happen. Hasn't happened yet, but it will. So criminals are different from governments. Criminals go after the low-hanging fruit. When criminals try to gain access to your network, they're not really after you. They're after money. If it's too hard, too slow, too expensive to gain access to your network, they will go after an easier target. And believe me, the internet is a garden of low-hanging fruits. They'll easily find easier places to hack. So to fight criminal attackers, you don't have to have perfect security. You just have to have a little bit better security than the other targets. But then when you are facing governments, the rules are different. Governmental attackers don't give up. If they can't get in, they will try again. If they still can't get in, they will try again. And if the attacker just never gives up, it's likely that sooner or later they will get in. And that makes them such a hard target or such a hard uh, enemy to fight when you are the target. And that means, my friends and colleagues, that the times of building walls around our networks are over. We can't keep all the attackers out. Even if they're not governmental, if they are persistent enough, they will get in. If you have large enough network, they will get in. So we have to stop thinking about how we could build stronger walls and start focusing on what's happening inside of the walls. So we're able to detect when there's a breach, so we can respond when there's a breach. And if you think about how much the world changed during 25 short years, from my trip to Austria and renting a boat, and how it seems impossible to now understand how you could even do that without the internet. Well, we are facing exactly as large change in the future as well. The things we now take for granted will seem like ancient history in very short time. 
And that means that your job, my job, our job, is not to secure computers. Our job is to secure the society. Thank you for your work. Thank you very much. That was wonderful, Mika. That's one of the best opening keynotes we've had at all. So can I ask you a quick question? Here's a punch card for you. Thank you. In the, in, in the same way as you had that moment with your uh, younger colleague, I had one with my daughter. I was explaining to her, I was saying, probably the single thing that makes her life most different to mine, and I, I picked this up and I said that, that, that these things are now mobile. I said, in my day, phones were connected. And before I had a chance to say to the wall or to a desk or whatever, she hopped in and said, you mean like to your pants? <laughs> and I did just think, for a second, how cool would it have been that you're out one night going, that's right, I'll call them, oh, fuck, I'm not wearing my phone pants, damn. <laughs> but my, I, I use my phone a lot. I live, my, my kids, it's like they're surgically attached. In the space of mobile, where are we at on security versus lack of security? Mm -hmm. Many people, um, especially outsiders of our field, somehow believe that mobile devices like phones and tablets would be less secure than computers because, you know, they're smaller and, I don't know, easier to lose, things like that. But of course, these are more secure than real computers because they are much more restricted. The main restriction is the App Store or Play model. The idea that you can't just randomly write software and deploy and run it on every device. It has to go through checks before it's downloaded from an App Store. And that really is the reason why we don't see malware on mobile devices. And that's why I am a bit worried about what's happening right now, especially about the fact that Apple is being taken into Supreme Court in the United States as they are being accused of monopoly model with the App Store. And uh, they're right, it is a monopoly, but it's a secure monopoly. And if the end result of that is that App Store is killed and iPhone users will start downloading their applications from random websites, we will end up with exactly the same problems we used to have on our computers. When most people in this room obviously get it, and I presume their personal and work security <clears throat> is pretty high. When you're talking to that average person who just needs to be a little bit better, what's, what's the single thing? If you could do one thing with just your random person in their home devices or work, what's the one thing someone can do to massively decrease their risk profile? It's quite depressing that we are in 2019 and we are still using passwords. Passwords which were invented pretty much when the in internet was invented, like, you know, 70s or something like that. It's way, way overdue to get rid of that. So my advice to the average person on the street is always password managers. Like, don't even try to manage your passwords because every single guidance and rule and helpful article in newspapers telling you how to pick a good password is always wrong because it's always the same goddamn advice about picking a really long and complex password uh, make sure it has lots of uppercase, lowercase numbers and punctuation and make sure it's completely different on every website and don't write it down. Which is basically saying that, you know, come up with something that you absolutely can't remember but don't write it down. Obviously, you can't do that. The only way they can do is password managers and that's my tip number one. Great. I'm going to get you to sign oh. my punch cards. Right. On there. Give him another round of applause. That was just wonderful. <laughs> we'll be hearing from Mikko a little bit over the next couple of days.